that Chan on the world just now. If you look at it from one perspective, it's pretty scary. The world has no one in charge. There's no protection. There's no shelter. We have nothing of our own, and we're slaves to craving. It's a pretty bleak picture. And it is meant to give rise to a sense of sangwega, thinking about the way we normally live our lives and the expectations we have on the world, and how they so often get disappointed. But you can look at them another way. It's liberating. The world here isn't designed by anybody. We're not here trying to figure out who the designer was or what the purpose of his design was or hers. As John Fung would like to say, nobody hired us to be born or paid us to be born. We were born out of our own desire. And we can make up our lives what we want to. The question is, are we going to use this freedom responsibly or not? I was reading a while back someone saying that, as Kant had pointed out, with the Enlightenment came maturity. We're talking about the European Enlightenment here. And as this person interpreted, it means that there's nobody up there telling us what to do. There's nobody up there we have to please, so we can just do what we want. That's irresponsible, because actions do have consequences for us and for others. And just doing what we want can often cause a lot of harm. We have to learn how to train our desires. If we're going to shape our lives in a way that really does give good results, we have to train the mind. have to train it to be honorable, to recognize its responsibilities. And one of our first responsibilities in a world like this is if we're going to look for any goodness, we have to look inside. It has to start with us. If we wait for other people to provide us with the love and care that we want, or the truthfulness that we want, there are cases when we can wait till our dying days and it's not going to come. Is there anything good going to happen with this system, which is very interconnected but doesn't really serve any particular purpose except for the purpose of each individual? And the problem is each individual has lots of conflicting purposes and is pressing the levers many times out of ignorance. This is why the world is such a mess as it is. But if you wait for everybody else, or just even a few other people, to be good examples, you let pass by your own opportunities to do good. So you've got to start right here, with this breath, with this moment of awareness. What's the best thing you can do with it? What's the most honorable thing you can do with it? The Buddha recommends looking for happiness with an attitude of universal goodwill. That's something that has to be developed. It's not innate to the mind, or any more innate than hatred can be. Hatred can be very easy to feel. Anger can be very easy to feel. Greed, aversion, jealousy. All these things are just as natural as the good side of the mind. And the mind is something that can change very quickly. There's a passage where the Buddha asks the monks, have you seen a moving picture show? When you look at the translation, you say, this must be a mistranslation. But it turns out they actually had a show that they called Moving Pictures. They would set up a lamp near a big blank wall, and they'd have material that was kind of like cellophane. I think it was made out of gelatin. And they'd paint pictures on it. And they paint scenes, and then they have little shadow puppets running through the scenes. From the light of the lamp, it would get projected on the wall. And he says those moving picture shows can be very variegated, but he says the human mind is a lot more variegated than that. 
or the animal kingdom. You think of all the different kinds of animals there are in the air, on the land, and in the sea. All those species of animals came from a particular desire. It was a mind of some sort that came up. Each individual mind basically came up, this, this would be a good place to be born, and this would be a good thing to be born as, and they go for it. So our mind has lots of qualities, not just innate goodness. And it's very changeable. In fact, the Buddha, who was a master at the apt simile, couldn't even think of a simile. He said it's hard to find a simile for how quick the changes of the mind can be. So you've got to train this, because if goodness is going to come out of this, it's got to be trained to be more consistent. That's what the mindfulness is all about, is to keep in mind what you really want, so you don't forget. And it requires determination. When the Buddha talks about goodwill, he says, this is a mindfulness on which you should be determined. Again, mindfulness being meaning something you keep in mind, so you don't forget. And you've got to be determined. You've got to keep working at it. You've got to be wise in how you understand goodwill and how you apply it. You've got to be truthful. You've got to learn how to give up a lot of unskillful thoughts that might be very tempting. You've got to keep your mind at peace, realizing that though you may wish for the well-being of all beings, that a lot of beings who are not interested in being very skillful in all this. And no matter how much you want their happiness, they're free to not go in that way. So all the qualities go into determination, wisdom, truthfulness, relinquishment, calm, are conditions for developing goodwill. So even though goodwill is unlimited, it's not unconditioned. And of course it meets up, as I said, with situations where there are people who are suffering and there's nothing you can do about it, or times when you're suffering, there seems to be nothing you can do about it, and that's when you've got to develop equanimity. So these are things you have to work on. It helps when you're working on goodwill to have a sense of well-being inside already. In John Lee's image is of a water tank. There's no, no water in the tank. You can open up the faucet and air will come out, but the coolness of the air coming out is nothing compared with the coolness of the water that you want. You've got to have water in the tank. So when you turn on the faucet, you get the cool water that's really refreshing. So we work with the breath, what the Buddha calls bodily fabrication. This is the energy that fabricates our sense of the body, try to work with it in a way that feels refreshing. So you can have a basis for your goodwill. And then learn how to think about goodwill. What does it mean? You're wishing that all beings create the causes for happiness. As one of the phrases is, may no being despise another or deceive another. In other words, you're not just wishing for people to sit around smiling, you're wishing them for act in, to act in ways that really do lead to happiness. So you direct your thoughts in that way, and you, and you evaluate to what extent can you really feel these feelings, have this attitude toward all beings. Is there anybody out there that you have trouble spreading these thoughts to? And if you're honest, you'll find that there are some people out there. Okay, how do you change your attitude so that it is possible to direct thoughts of goodwill to that person in all sincerity? Again, this goes back to your understanding of what goodwill is. You're wishing for happiness, and you're wishing that that person understand and work on the causes of happiness, true happiness. And this part of you that wants that person to suffer a little bit first, okay, reflect on that. Like those people we saw in the courtroom the other day who got all that way because they wanted to see, get vengeance. It was a sad sight. It 
terms of what forgiveness is such a good gift to give, even though you may not be able to have reconciliation with other people, at least you can learn how to forgive. Allow that person the possibility of changing his or her ways and finding happiness more quickly than you might have, you might have wished otherwise. But when you can teach your mind how to think in these ways, it really helps. So an attitude of goodwill does have its conditions. You make it unlimited, it has lots of conditions. They say for Brahmas, it's very easy to feel unlimited goodwill. That's something they've worked on. When they were human beings, they had to work on this. Because it's very easy for us to be partial. Goodwill for this group, but not for that group. Or goodwill for this person under these conditions, but not under those. Even for ourselves, there are times when we have trouble feeling goodwill for ourselves. So it takes training, it takes determination. And you have to be mindful. In the sense that you want to keep remembering this. So we work with the breath to develop our mindfulness, to stitch together our moments of attention so that things don't slip through the cracks. And as we work on the conditions, we get a goodwill that is more and more reliable. It becomes totally reliable only with the noble attainments. That's when the mind has found a basis for happening inside that really is unconditioned. It makes it a lot easier to have unconditional attitudes, positive attitudes. Until then, it's something you've got to work at all the time. To learn how to give the mind the nourishment it needs with your concentration so it has the strength to keep working at this all the time. It doesn't run out. 